Hello, and welcome to the Joyful Bookshelf, where books are fun. Subscribe for new books read aloud every week. The Giraffe That Walked to Paris by Nancy Milton, illustrated by Roger Roth. This is the true story of a wonderful giraffe that lived a long time ago. She was young and beautiful, and she belonged to the Pasha of Egypt. In the year 1826, there had been a disagreement between Egypt and France. What can I do, the Pasha wondered, so that the French people and the Egyptian people will be friends? I know what you can do, the French ambassador told him. You can give the King of France a present. What do you think he'd like, the Pasha asked. The ambassador thought very carefully and then replied, I think he'd like a giraffe. The people of France have never seen one. That's an excellent idea, the Pasha said. I'll send him my beautiful giraffe right away. The shortest way to travel from Egypt to France was to sail from one side of the Mediterranean Sea to the other. We'll need a ship, said the ambassador. The ambassador's helpers found a good ship, named the Two Brothers, with a captain who was very pleased to take the giraffe to France. I'll take care of her as if she were my own daughter, he said. Even though the giraffe was 11 feet tall, she was still a baby. Every day she drank three or four big buckets full of milk. I can see we're going to need a cow, the ambassador said. Actually, they needed three cows and a person to milk them as well. I think the best person to milk the cows and take care of the giraffe is my Egyptian stableman, Hassan, the ambassador said. He knows a lot about animals. But one man wasn't enough, so Hassan found two helpers named Atir and Yusuf. When the ambassador saw that there was still some room on the ship, he decided he'd like to send a present to the king also. Knowing that the king liked African animals, he asked Hassan if he could find another interesting one. Hassan found a beautiful big antelope. On a clear October day, the giraffe, the cows, and the antelope were all in their places in the hold of the ship. The giraffe was lucky. She could see everything because her long neck stuck up through the hole that had been cut in the deck. There was straw padding around the sides so she wouldn't get bumped and a big canvas over her head so she wouldn't get too much sun or rain. Goodbye, the ambassador called as he waved from the dock. Bon voyage, dear giraffe. The wind puffed out the white sails. The flags of France and Egypt flew from the mast and the two brothers sailed out into the Mediterranean Sea. It was a fine trip. The only bad thing that happened was that one cow got seasick. In late October, the ship sailed into the port of Marseille, France. In Paris, King Charles X was very excited to hear the news. Wonderful, he said. My giraffe is in France. I can't wait to see her. For the king, like the rest of the French people, had never seen a real giraffe. When will she arrive? I hope it will be in time for Christmas. The king's counselor was worried. He knew that kings could be quite difficult. Your majesty, he said politely, giraffes are used to hot weather. You know how cold it gets here in the winter. Yes, of course I know, the king replied impatiently. Marseille is in the south of France, the counselor said carefully. It's warmer there in the winter. Perhaps it would be better... The king looked unhappy. You think the giraffe should spend the winter in Marseille? Yes, your majesty, the counselor replied, and come to Paris in the spring when the weather is warmer. The king sighed, but he knew the counselor was right. I won't be able to see my wonderful present for such a long time, he said sadly. The counselor wanted to make the king feel better, so he found a famous Paris scientist to draw a picture of a giraffe for the king. The scientist had never seen a real giraffe either, but the king was very pleased with the picture. The giraffe was very popular in Marseille. School children came with their teachers to visit her. Professors studied her. Newspapers printed stories about her. Everyone wanted to see the strange animal with the long neck. Every day, exactly at noon, the big gates of the courtyard where she lived swung open, and la giraffe, as she was called in France, walked out into the street. The sidewalks were always crowded with people waiting to see her. 
Be careful! Get out of the way! The policeman shouted. The giraffe is coming! The giraffe is coming! All through the winter, the giraffe went walking every day, and the people never got tired of seeing her. At last, spring came. In Paris, the king looked out the window and saw new green leaves and pink and yellow flowers in his garden. I want to see my giraffe, he said. I've waited a very long time for my present. Yes, your majesty, the counselor said nervously. I'm sure the giraffe will arrive soon. But the counselor was worried, for he had received letters from Marseille, and he knew it wouldn't be easy to get the giraffe to Paris. The men in Marseille couldn't decide what to do. La Giraffe was much too tall to be put in a wagon or a carriage. She had already taken a long boat trip and might not enjoy another one. Finally, Hassan had an idea. She's a very good walker, he said. She's had lots of exercise every day. Maybe she could walk to Paris. What an excellent idea. Everyone was very happy. But then there was another problem. Who will lead her there? After all, she's going to Paris to meet the King of France. She must be led by a Frenchman, and it must be one who knows something about giraffes. Everyone was silent. There weren't many Frenchmen who knew anything about giraffes. But in Paris there was one, a professor who had been to Egypt. Professor St. Hilier was old and his health wasn't very good, but when he heard that someone was needed to lead the giraffe to Paris, he was very excited. He jumped up and said, Yes, yes, I'll go to Marseille and bring La Giraffe back here to the king. He packed a bag, hopped into a stagecoach, and in six and a half days, he met the giraffe. Professor St. Hilier had a big job getting everything ready for his journey to Paris. The cows could walk with the giraffe, but the antelope was very big and very dangerous. It wouldn't walk quietly along the road like the giraffe and the cows. We'll need a strong cage for that antelope, the professor said. We'll need a coach to carry the cage and a man to drive the coach. And then he said, the giraffe needs a raincoat. She's used to the hot sun, but she isn't used to wind and rain, and it rains a lot in France in the spring. It isn't easy to make a raincoat for a giraffe, but Professor St. Hilier designed a good one that covered her whole body and buttoned down the front. It even had a hood to keep her head and long neck dry. Finally, on a rainy morning in May, the big procession left Marseille. High above everyone else, there was La Giraffe, looking very handsome in her new raincoat. Then, there were the cows, the professor in his carriage, Hassan, Atir, Yusuf, and a translator to help the men understand each other's languages. There were soldiers who rode ahead to tell everyone they were coming. And last of all, there was the coach pulled by a horse and loaded with bags and sacks and the dangerous antelope in its strong cage. In Paris, the king was pacing up and down the long halls of his castle. It's almost the beginning of summer, he said to his counselor. Where is my giraffe? Your giraffe is walking to Paris, your majesty. I'm sure she's walking as fast as she can. But the counselor was still worried, for truthfully, he had no idea how fast a giraffe could walk. The procession to Paris was a great success. Everywhere people were waiting to welcome the giraffe. They talked about her and wrote letters to their aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers. They said, we saw La Giraffe. She's as tall as a house. She has the longest neck you've ever seen. You must see her too. So as La Giraffe and her procession got closer to Paris, more and more people crowded the roads and the towns. They named streets after her. They put pictures of her on the signboards of bakeries and restaurants, hotels and grocery stores. Soon, there were giraffe pictures in every town she had walked through. Professor St. Hilier wrote reports and sent them to the king. The counselor read them aloud. His Majesty's giraffe is in excellent health. She has a sweet and gentle nature. The people of France love her. That's all very well, the king said, but when am I going to see her? The professor says that La Giraffe should arrive by the end of June. All of Paris is getting ready to greet her then. The giraffe is my present, the king said, but I'll be the last person in Paris to see her. That's not fair, 
I want to go with everyone else to welcome her. The counselor gasped. <gasps> but your majesty, that's impossible. The king can't just do whatever he wants to do. The present comes to the king. The king doesn't go to the present. When the procession reached the outskirts of Paris, everyone in the whole city wanted to go out and meet the king's giraffe. They went in wagons, in coaches, and in boats on the river. They took along picnic lunches so they could have a giraffe party. The giraffe is here! The giraffe is here! They shouted. It was a very exciting day, but the king wasn't there. He had to stay at home in his castle. At 5 p.m. on June 30th, 1827, Professor St. Hilier led the giraffe into her new home, a yard in the Paris Zoo. It had taken the procession 41 days to walk from Marseille. Goodbye, la giraffe, he said. Goodbye, goodbye. He waved to the cows and the antelope, to Hassan, Atir, Yusuf, the coach driver, and the translator. I'm exhausted. I'm going home. But no sooner had the professor collapsed into his comfortable old armchair than a messenger knocked on his door. The king is waiting to see his giraffe, the messenger said. He wants you to bring her as soon as you can. Oh dear, oh dear, the tired professor thought. They couldn't just deliver La Giraffe to the king's back door. By now she was famous all over Paris, and all the important people of the city wanted to see her. There had to be a proper ceremony. It would take a lot of work to get everything ready. But at last, the great day came. On July 9th, a wonderful parade marched along the River Seine to the King's Castle at St. Cloud. There were soldiers in splendid uniforms wearing tall hats with feather plumes on top. There were professors in long robes of purple and red and green with white fur collars. There were horses dancing and prancing and carrying generals on their backs. La Giraffe was dressed up too. On her back, she wore a blanket beautifully decorated with the signs of the kings of France and Egypt. Hassan, Atir, and Yusuf led her proudly. And Professor St. Hilier, wearing his best clothes, walked happily in front of her. When the parade reached the garden of the king's castle, everyone lined up with the giraffe in the most important place of all. The big doors of the castle opened and out walked King Charles. He couldn't believe his eyes. The spotted animal that stood in front of him was as tall as a building. Her neck was much, much longer than the one in his picture, but he tried not to look surprised. Did you have a pleasant trip? He asked Professor St. Hilier politely. Yes, thank you, your majesty, the professor replied. Your giraffe is a very good animal. Would you like to see her walk? Yes, I would, the king said. Hassan, Atir, and Yusuf led the giraffe around the big green lawn. Why, look at that, the king said. First she swings both of her right legs, and then she swings both of her left legs. That's not what my horses do. Oh, she's very different from a horse, Professor St. Hilier said. She has a short body and long legs. If she didn't walk that way, her back feet would step on her front feet. The king laughed. He was very pleased with his new giraffe. He'd never imagined that there could be such a strange creature in the whole world. The king came close to the giraffe. In his hand, he held the petals of a red rose. Here you are, my giraffe, he said. Try these, I think you'll like them. It is difficult for a giraffe to bend down, but La Giraffe could see that the king had something good to eat in his hand. So she spread her front legs wide apart and lowered her neck. She ate the rose petals from the king's own hand. And while her head was low enough to reach, the king's daughter-in-law put a garland of flowers around her neck, and his two grandchildren petted her carefully. The lion may be the king of the animals, King Charles said happily, but my giraffe is certainly the queen. What a beautiful giraffe. What a wonderful day. When it was over, La Giraffe went back to her new home at the zoo. Hassan and Yusuf returned to Egypt, but Atir stayed to take care of the giraffe. Professor St. Hilier and his friends had a special room made for them in a big glass building in the middle of the zoo. There was a stove to keep the giraffe warm in cold weather and doors that opened to let her outside when the weather was nice. 
Every night, Atir climbed two ladders to get to his bed high up near La Giraffe's head. And every day he fed her and brushed her and took her for a walk. The people of Paris loved the giraffe very much. Thousands of them came to visit her. They put her picture on dresses and shirts and purses and on plates and cups and coffee pots. Women wore their hair in a new style, very tall like a giraffe. And when children went to the zoo to see the real giraffe, they bought gingerbread giraffes and ate them all up. That was a long time ago. But even today, when French people visit the zoo where the king's giraffe lived and the gardens where she took her walks with a tear, they still remember her. Thank you for watching the Joyful Bookshelf. If you liked today's video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of my new videos.